Okay, well, let's get started. This is lecture 12 in uh, virtual tissue modeling. As always, I have to remind you that the class is live streamed on YouTube and also made available in edited form later. Today, we're going to start talking about network modeling. People, uh, Some people have taken the network modeling course, and so for them, this will be a review. Uh, but I'd like to get us to the point of thinking about biochemical control of cell behaviors. Uh, today is going to be mostly technical. And then uh, next week, we will actually uh, do something a little bit more serious about the integration. So we'll start out with uh, student project updates from people who are here. And then uh, we can... If people have questions about the homework, I'll be happy to answer those. Um, and then we'll start talking about network modeling. Uh, we'll do a very quick fly through of some basic concepts. If you want more detail, uh, there'll be more slides that we're not going to see that are hidden. And then also you can see video versions of these uh, lecture, which is a little bit more complete online. And then we'll start doing some very simple uh, exercises with uh, network modeling inside of CompuCell. We'll talk a little bit about how you specify network models in CompuCell, um, and we'll see how far we get uh, during the day. Okay, to begin with, I'd like to ask people about project updates. So today we're going to start talking about uh, control of cells. Uh, in this class so far, we've talked about chemical fields, which are at the level of multiple cells, interactions between cells. So we've talked about the behaviors of individual cells uh, and their interactions. Uh, in reality, the way cells act is controlled by uh, both biochemical networks within the cell and by very complex cytoskeletal machinery that operates inside of the cells. And typically in the kinds of simulations that we do, uh, we're not going to model that uh, microscopic machinery uh, is too complicated and it's uh, too expensive to simulate. Uh, although there definitely are uh, computer frameworks that do try to model the individual uh, motors that act inside of individual cells. Uh, but the signaling metabolic and regulatory networks that operate inside of cells uh, are uh, typically modeled in complex uh, simulations. And I'm going to talk today about a little bit about that. Uh, the fall course, C34542, is a whole semester about that kind of modeling. Uh, here, we're only going to touch on a few of the issues there. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, there's that course. Some of you have taken it. Uh, and you can certainly watch those videos online. Um, if you're interested, uh, there is the quick start guide, uh, which I sent around in the email. I hope people had a chance to look at that. Uh, there is the Tularia Bantamone cheat sheet, which is a single page summary of everything you need to know for this purpose, uh, which I asked you to print out. And if you want more, that fall course uses Herbert Sauer's textbook, Systems Biology, Introduction to Pathway Modeling, uh, which is also available downloadable online. Um, and there are plenty of other places to go to. Again, for the purpose of this class, we're only going to do very elementary things. Uh, you don't need a lot of uh, sophistication either with the network concepts themselves or with the software. We're going to use the, the basic elements. Of it. So when we talk about biological networks, there really are multiple kinds. Um, there are four main types. Uh, there are chemical reaction and metabolic networks that create and destroy the chemical components of cells and tissues. Uh, there are signaling networks that uh, operate to transfer information uh, within cells and also between cells. There are gene regulatory networks that turn the expression of genes on and off. And 
uh, if we're thinking about the context of the body as a whole, uh, blood flow transports chemicals through the body, through the organ systems. Uh, and so what are called physiologically based pharmacokinetic models uh, model actually the transport, uh, absorption, uh, distribution, uh, metabolism, and elimination of chemicals in the body. And so those are the four classic those are the four classic types of uh, biological networks. Um, if we talk about chemical reaction networks, these are the ones that probably are most familiar to people. Uh, these are typically written as chemical reaction formulae. Two molecules of ADP uh, react reversibly to form a molecule of ATP and a molecule of AMP. We might have some stack of chemical reactions Two molecules of A go reversibly to B. To B goes reversibly to three molecules of C. C and A combine to form D. And this is the typical structure that we're used to. Um, there are a variety of notations for chemical networks. In general, when we have transformation or transport, uh, we'll use an arrow with a point on the end. Um, any uh, network of this kind uh, has associated with it a rate of reaction, uh, V, and VF means the forward rate of reaction. That would be the rate at which ADP is turned into ATP plus AMP. That is left to right in the diagram. And uh, we're going to, if you dig into this a little bit more, we're not going to go into this in much detail. You'll discover that the notation in, in, in the literature is not very consistent. Uh, the way chemical reactions are written isn't always very consistent. In general, we think of chemical reactions as being described as continuous processes in time. In reality, the, the interaction of in two individual molecules is always a discrete event. Uh, but if the concentrations of the chemicals are large enough, we can model those stochastic interactions as a continuous time process. And that's what's known as reaction kinetics. Uh, and so here uh, I have molecules A plus B reacting to form molecule C at a rate VF, forward rate of reaction. And that forward rate of reaction can only depend on the concentrations of A and B. Typically, and there'll be some issues occasionally with uh, the way PowerPoint reformats things, the uh, standard uh, letter A, capital A, B, C, are the chemical species, the names of the chemical species, and the italicized versions of that are their concentrations, chemical concentrations. If I have a chemical reaction A plus B goes to C, then that implies three ordinary differential equations for the concentrations of the species. Uh, dA by dt is minus Vf AB because Vf is uh, destroying uh, A dB by dt is minus Vf AB, again, because the reaction is destroying B, and dC by dt is Vf AB because I'm creating C. If we want to do any more than write this framework, we have to have a hypothesis about what the form of the rate law is. Uh, chemists will know that the simplest reaction rate law that we can write is what's called the law of mass action, which says that the rate of reaction is proportional to the concentration of the various chemical components. We're not going to go into detail here about why that's a reasonable hypothesis, but one thing you might want to think about as a justification is that if I have no A, I can't have the reaction. So Vf of 0, comma B has to be 0. Similarly, Vf of A, comma 0 has to be 0. And if I want to be sure that my rate is zero, when either A or B are zero, then multiplication is a way to do that. 
if I use the law of mass action, I can plug that in for VF. dA by dt is minus K, that's the rate of reaction, times A times B. dB by dt minus K A times B. dC by dt equals K A B. Notice that I started out with a single reaction equation, and that's generating three separate ordinary differential equations, one for each concentration. Okay. In protein signaling, uh, these again describe the flow of information in the cell. Um, these have typical biological structures. Uh, very often you will have uh, transmembrane uh, signaling molecules. Uh, where one component of the molecule is in the extracellular space and one component of the molecule is inside the cell cytoplasm. Very often, when a molecule binds to the extracellular domain, there will be a change in the intracellular domain, which will typically release another molecule that's bound to the intracellular domain, and that molecule in turn will go on and do something. Uh, occasionally, uh, signals will go through the cell membrane. Sometimes the signals are freely diffusing, and sometimes the signals are from binding of uh, molecules on the surface of one cell to another. There are many different ways that cells can receive signals. Once the signal is received, uh, in the case of delta notch, actually the molecule itself, the signal, the, the receptor is actually cleaved as opposed to having a separate molecules detach. Uh, there are what are called signal transduction cascades. And the classic signal transduction cascade element is something called the kinase. Kinases are molecules that attach phosphates to other molecules. And so uh, very often in biological systems, we'll find uh, pairs of molecular species, uh, one of which uh, will be written by itself, one of which will often have a star associated with it. The star indicates that a phosphate group has been attached to it. That's called the phosphorylated form. Uh, kinases, usually the phosphorylated form is active and the non-phosphorylated form is inactive. Sometimes it's the opposite. And you'll sometimes see these funny cascades where here, MAP kinase 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 is phosphorylated to make phosphorylated MAP kinase 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 kinase. MAP kinase 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 attaches a phosphate group to MAP kinase kinase, phosphorylating it. Phosphorylated MAP kinase kinase attaches a phosphate group to MAP kinase, phosphorylating it. And that MAP kinase phosphorylated form in turn acts uh, on the cell cycle. Uh, you could ask why on earth do you have these complicated stacks? And the answer is one, they allow a lot of intermediate control of what's going to happen. And two, they uh, take initially noisy or weak signals and make them more Boolean in their behaviors. Uh, in general, this kind of signaling network operates on a time scale that's slower than the chemical reaction network that we saw before uh, and faster than uh, gene regulatory networks. Gene regulatory networks are poss possibly the thing that one thinks of most classically as a network inside of cells. Uh, at any given time in any given cell, some genes are being transcribed. Their DNA is being of particular genes is being copied into RNA. Uh, the pattern of that, uh, to a large extent, although not entirely, determines what kind of cell it is. Uh, and so, for example, in cell differentiation, the genes are turned on and off. Uh, sometimes genes are also turned on and off, not in terms of differentiation, but in response to extracellular uh, events or intracellular events. For example, during the cell cycle, certain genes will be turned on at different phases of the cell cycle. Uh, when, a gene, when a cell is infected with a virus, uh, the virus will force the cell uh, to uh, produce certain proteins. Uh, and the cell will also respond 
to the infection by put, turning on certain kinds of antiviral signals as well. Uh, notationally, uh, you'll see these lines that are meant to indicate patches of DNA. The little arrow coming up on the right with the arrow coming off is meant to represent the uh, production of RNA from the transcription of the gene. On the left-hand side, you'll see little arrows of different colors pointing to the gene. Those represent regulators, uh, molecules that bind to the gene, uh, actually upstream usually of the gene, uh, that turn on or off transcription. Uh, gene regulatory networks typically control long-term cell behaviors, uh, like differentiation of cells from one site to another. Although it's important to note that uh, the uh, regulators by themselves cannot lead to stable differentiation. There are other kinds of uh, control of gene activity that are, in fact, longer lasting. And exactly how uh, genes being turned on and off by regulators turns into these long-term uh, control is not still very well understood. There's a lot about gene regulation and cell differentiation that's an open scientific problem. Uh, in particular, uh, methylation of DNA, where the DNA itself is chemically modified, um, is a classic way in which genes are inactivated over the long term. Uh, demethylation of DNA was a critical factor in the creation of stem cells from adult cells. Uh, that was the biggest thing they had to learn how to do to, to create uh, induced stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells, was demethylation. Um, we're not going to go into the details of how genes work, uh, but genes are, DNA is also wrapped on histones. Uh, the histones that the DNA is wrapped on can be methylated, which inhibits uh, transcription of the DNA bound around them, or acetylated, which promotes transcription. And the GNA itself in chromosomes can be rearranged, uh, which can modify the rate of transcription as well. So there are a lot of non-transcriptional non, uh, factor modifications of, of transcription that aren't shown in a diagram like this. So it's just, well, we're certainly not going to worry about that in this course, but it's worth remembering that when you see a diagram like this, it's a huge oversimplification of what's really happening in the cell. The basic concept of gene regulatory notation comes back to the fundamental dogma of, bi of biology, a central theorem of biology, which is that you have DNA. The DNA is transcribed by RNA polymerase to form an RNA transcript. That RNA transcript is in turn edited to remove the introns and has a poly A tail attached to it uh, to form a messenger RNA. That messenger RNA then attaches to a ribosome. The ribosome then uh, translates that uh, messenger RNA uh, into a protein. And that protein itself is then uh, processed further uh, to make the finished protein. So there are actually a lot of steps from the DNA in the gene uh, to the finished protein. Uh, we're typically going to ignore those and just assume that the gene produces the protein. Uh, that's a pretty harsh assumption. In general, genes have some rate of basal transcription. They're always on at some very low level. Um, an inducer, uh, when present, increases the rate of, of transcription of the gene. Um, there are also inhibitors that reduce the rate of transcription of the gene. Uh, but there are also possibilities of uh, changing uh, each of these processes uh, and changing the rate of production. So the the, the uh, binding of, uh, of a promoter to the gene and the beginning of the production of uh, messenger RNA uh, don't necessarily mean that the rate of protein production goes up in the same way. There's also, in this case, a delay. Uh, it takes time to make the messenger RNA. It takes time for the messenger RNA to get edited. 
It takes time for it to get out of the nucleus to the ribosome. It takes time for the ribosome to translate it. And therefore, uh, from the time you bind a transcription factor to DNA to the time you actually have protein, there is no production of the protein. So there really is a delay, which is actually rather unusual in biology. Um, and that delay typically for a typical length protein is about 20 minutes. And so cells really can't change their their uh, uh, gene expression state a much faster than 15 to 20 minutes. And so there's an intrinsic time scale. It's pretty slow for this. Uh, gene regulatory networks have a variety of motifs. I mentioned gene activation. There's also gene repression. You can have multiple factors activating and inhibiting the same gene, and they can interact in complex ways. Uh, you can have the product of one gene inhibit or activate another gene. You can have the product of a gene inhibit the production of the gene itself, transcription of the gene itself. Uh, you can have uh, a modulation of the activity of a promoter uh, by another molecule. And uh, phosphorylation can change whether a particular molecule activates or inactivates a gene. Um, in general, genes are either being transcribed or not being transcribed. The rate at which they're transcribed is not modulated very much. And so in the simulations that we're doing, the, the fact that we're going to have modulation of uh, gene uh, transcription is really uh, an average over time. What happens is that the concentration of a promoter or an inhibitor will change the duty cycle of the gene's transcription. The fraction of the time the gene is being transcribed will change and averaged over a longer enough time, that fraction of time will correspond to the rate of production of the protein. Okay, if we jump up to the highest scale, again, we have blood flow in the body. Um, we have molecules that are absorbed, for example, through the skin, through the lungs, through the gut. Um, most molecules in the body are broken down in the liver. Uh, the liver produces bile, which is then passed to the gut and put eliminated in the feces. Uh, other molecular species uh, go to the kidneys and are excreted in the urine. Some molecules are excreted in the sweat. Uh, a few molecular species are exhaled through, through gas exchange in the lungs. Uh, but the main way that... Uh, main elimination process in the body is through the liver. That's one of the reasons the liver is, tends to get damaged most easily by chemical uh, toxicants, uh, a little bit less in the kidneys. Uh, and that gives rise to uh, additional time scales. If you take a pill, it takes time for the pill to get from your mouth into your gut. It takes time for the pill to dissolve. The chemicals in the pill have to be absorbed uh, by the gut lining, a uh, pass into the bloodstream. Uh, circulation through the body is pretty fast. Um, it's only really a few seconds for circulation to happen. Uh, and so blood flow is actually pretty fast in the body. Uh, and then the liver will absorb those chemicals, uh, metabolize them, and eventually excrete them. And so if you want to understand something like, if I give an injection or I take a pill, what's the concentration of drug in my body at a given time or its metabolites, then these PBPK models are the classic thing to use. Uh, there are other more generic kinds of models which you can think of as networks. Uh, population dynamic models look at how many cells of different types are present in a given location. It can also be true for populations in an ecosystem. Uh, for example, I could have stem cells in the colonic crypt uh, that reproduce. Some of them die, some of them divide, some of them differentiate into what are called semi-differentiated or transient amplifying cells. Those reproduce, a few of them die. Those in turn differentiate into fully differentiated cells. Uh, those differentiated cells don't divide anymore, but they can die. 
So that would be an ODE model of this complex spatial organization of the colonic crypt. Uh, anything, any place where you have epithelia, like the skin, uh, the lining of the lungs, the lining of the blood vessels, you're going to have some turnover of cells of this kind. Another kind of uh, biological network, it's actually was talked about a lot in the meeting I was at last week, are what are called outcome networks. Uh, these could represent uh, both chemical changes and behavioral changes in the system. Uh, for example, you might have a chemical that uh, damages the DNA. The DNA damage in turn leads to repair mechanisms. Those repair mechanisms cause uh, deviations in the way the cell regulates itself, which eventually lead to cancerous outcomes. Uh, so that would be what's called an adverse outcome pathway. Uh, when a cell is infected with a virus, it changes its behavior. And so there are what are called disease maps that try to understand at a chemical level and a systems level how these things interact. Um, there also are what are called physiological maps that discuss how the normal interactions between cells and within cells work in the body. Uh, the difference between, say, an outcome network and a biochemical network is that the nodes in a biochemical network are always going to be molecular species. In an outcome network, some of the nodes may be molecular species. Others might be the rate of cell proliferation, the rate of cell death, the rate of cell movement. Uh, so they could be processes as well as uh, as chemical species. Uh, in reality, all of these things are going on simultaneously inside of your body. Um, and if we really want to understand uh, developmental biology, homeostasis, or illness, uh, we want to be able to control it, do we actually have to have these networks work together? Um, so within a single cell, uh, we're going to have at least uh, four of this kind of network. For example, here we have signals that come into the cell uh, uh, through uh, molecules on their surface. Growth factors bind to those, thing, those signals, those uh, molecules. Those molecules then send signals that promote cell proliferation, for example, the growth and division of the cell. Other signals might come in and promote the death of the cell. Uh, as the cell is going through the cell cycle, you're going to have gene regulatory networks that are going to turn the expression of particular genes on and off. Uh, all of those things are going to change the metabolic activity of the cell, uh, the cell's energy production and production of biochemical components. And all of them require transport of material from one place to another which you model in the pharmacokinetic models. So actually, any real model of what's going on inside of a cell is going to require all four kinds of networks. Transport networks, uh, metabolic and chemical transformation networks, signaling networks, and gene regulatory networks. Okay. None of that biological complexity really affects the very simple things that we need to do to build a network model. Once we have the abstraction of a network, um, we can build uh, networks that are as complex as we need for the particular purpose that we're interested in. The one thing that we're going to find with uh, antimony, which is the language we're going to use uh, to specify network models, is that it cannot specify time delays. And so that if we want explicit time delays in our simulations, we're going to have to use Python to implement them. As far as this class goes, we're not going to do that. Uh, but if you look at complex models using CompuCell, uh, you'll find that it uses those. Um, so uh, we're going to use the antimony language to specify dynamic networks in CompuCell. Uh, those antimony networks are going to be written inside of Python steppables uh, in Twitter. They can also be read in from external files. Uh, CompuCell actually can process a whole variety of different network model specifications, uh, not just antimony, uh, but for the purpose of this class, we're going to focus on the antimony models. The antimony models are read, they're parsed, 
uh, converted into sets of ordinary differential equations. And then those are actually solved numerically using the SBML solver library, which is based on Lib Roadrunner inside of CompuSum. Again, if you have questions about antimony and tellurium, which are the modeling framework for the networks, uh, you can find tellurium, read the docs IO and the cheat sheet that I handed up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to run an antimony model inside of CompuCell. And um, I've got, if we had more time, I would show you from the beginning about how to build such a model. Uh, but we're not going to do that today. Today, we are simply going to start out with a model of that kind. And I would like everyone to download it from the student materials folder. And I will put the link in the chat for you. You've got it here as well, but you put it in the chat. So I need everybody to download that and open it in Twitter and make sure that it runs. And again, since people got confused about this, you must, when you use Twitit, make sure that you write your models to a directory, which is a writable directory for you. So you can't put it, if you have, if you're, depending on your computer ca configuration, put it on your desktop, put it, put it in a folder inside uh, uh, that you have control over in a user folder. Don't try to write to the, the, the root directory of the computer, okay? So I will give people a minute to download that and unpack it and open it and twit it uh, and save it as a local file in a writable directory. And I'll wait for people to give me a thumbs up when they've got it done. If you've got it working, uh, by all means, uh, run it and see what it does. Uh, but for the moment, and we're just uh, getting you to to download it and install. Santoshi, would you want to screen share it so you can show us what you've got? Okay, that looks fine. Now, uh, the code that we have here is not very complicated, but for the moment, we're going to be concentrating just on the new things about the code. And so, Hard as it is, I would ask you to please try to ignore everything except the things I'm going to draw your attention to. So within Twitter, please open the steppable. Can everybody go to the steppable all right? I see Alex nodding his head. And if you look in the steppable, you will see at the top of the steppable a comment, type Tellurium model here model equals and then triple quote then some text and end triple quote and a line that will say variables equals quote x colon quote red comma quote y colon blue and if i look in my uh, model specification i will see in line 14 a variable named x and in line 15 a variable named y and what this code will allow you to do is you will be able to type in this region 5 to 15, you'll be able to type your network model. You'll type the names of the variables, in this case, X and Y, but you might have A, B, C, D, and E here in line 18, and the colors that you want to have them show up as uh, after that. So did people run this now? Now try running it. Does it run? I want to make sure that everybody everybody has it running. So uh, can I get, you can put in the chat, did it run? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. Great. Kyle, you uh, said you ran for you too. So you should see something that looks like that. Did it, does it, you get something like that? Yeah, yes. Great, perfect, wonderful. All, All right. right. So what we're going to be doing for the next hour or so is we're going to be changing those lines 5 to 15 and line 18 and ignoring everything else. 
we may have to change time scales a little bit, uh, uh, which will involve a few extra lines. But the whole point of this is to write a little framework that lets us run a little network model without having to worry about how CompuCell interacts with it. All right. So in the simulation that you've got loaded, our default is a chemical reaction, which is X goes to Y at a rate B times X, and Y goes back to a X at a rate C times Y. Not very exciting. Um, if I want uh, from those simple reversible chemical reaction, I can calculate the equilibrium ratio between X and Y. It's C over B. And so in my simulation, I have the parameters B and C. The ratio between X and Y should be C over B. Here it's 0.01 divided by 0.1. It's 10 to 1. Now, why don't you try changing the value of C in line 11 from 0.01 to 0.1? Run it and tell me what happens. How is it different? OK. So you have to just change line 11 from 0.01 to 0.1, hit save, and then run it again. That maybe it's a good idea to take a screenshot of the simulation with the first values beforehand so that you'll be able to compare it. Did things change? If you don't remember what it looked like before, put it back to 0.01 and run it again and see what's different. It emerges. Right. So now the equilibrium values of, C, B, of X and Y are equal to each other. Um, before you had wound up with a lot more of one than the other. So why don't you try changing B and C a little bit uh, and see what happens to your values. Just take a minute to do that. Try, try three different values of B and C. Remember that in scientific plots, if you right-click on the scientific plot, you can save it or copy it. You can always do a screenshot, but you can also... Do the screenshot through a right click over the over the plot if you want to do it that way. So that you have it for reference. Okay. So now you've run a little network simulation. And we haven't gone into all the details, but it's actually not that complicated to do it. What I'd like to do now um, is explain uh, very briefly how you write network models in antimony. And uh, I'll tell you a few things about uh, just generically about uh, how this works, which we're not going to worry about now, but we'll come back to. Um, we're going to be solving the networks um, as ordinary differential equations, these continuous time networks. Um, it's possible to solve them stochastically using what's called a Gillespie solver, uh, if we want. Uh, it's also possible to write uh, biochemical networks in the form of what are called Boolean network models, in which case you use something called a MABOS solver. Um, and so actually, CompuCell allows you to write a lot of different kinds of network models. But the network structure will be the same in any of these. Um, CompuCell automatically makes all of the variables and parameters that are named uh, inside of an antimony model available as dictionary entries. We're used to using dictionary entries, so it should be OK. Um, if you name a chemical reaction like this, and we'll come back to that, then the rate of the chemical reaction is also made available as a dictionary entry. Um, there are what are called free-floating models, which are models that run inside of the simulation as a whole. And there also are 
models that are attached to individual cells in the simulation. Um, we'll reference uh, the free-floating ones, self.sbml.model, and then the name of the variable or parameter. Um, inside of a cell, it'll be cell.sbml.model, name of the variable. So this is actually, the nomenclature is consistent, uh, unlike for the basic dictionary where it has uh, uh, an inconsistent name. And Twitit under SBML solver, has all of the functions that you would need. And really, the name should be something like Network Solver instead of SBML Solver. Um, maybe we should put a, a, a ticket in saying we should change that in Twitter, uh, Pedro. Um, the reason it says SBML here and here and here is that while these days we use the antimony language for, models, for network model specifications, um, the first network model spec language we supported was SBML. Uh, and so that's why you see this SBML name. So just have to mentally map the word SBML to network when you see it. Okay. So let's talk about how we specify models, network models. So the first thing that we have to know is that antimony models are specified just as strings, as Python strings. So it's just a, an alphanumeric string of characters. Um, if you want in Python to have carriage returns inside of a string, you have to use triple quotes, not single quotes. And you can either use triple single quotes or triple double quotes. But if you use triple single quotes at the beginning, you have to use triple single quotes at the end. Uh, if you use triple double quotes at the beginning, you have to use triple double quotes at the end. All of the stuff in yellow, or I'm not exactly sure what color that is, orangey yellow, camel maybe, um, is uh, the model specification. And if you look inside of your Twitter, you'll see model equals triple quotes and then some text and then triple quotes. Okay. Uh, Antimony has a concept of a comment, or which is a double slash or a hash sign works for comment as well. Um, carriage returns work as delimiters in antimony. Uh, semicolons also work as delimiters. Uh, antimony syntax is really C++ derived syntax. So this, the semicolon is a delimiter. And so here we'll see uh, a delimiter, 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 comment, comment, comment. Those are the things that don't really do much. Uh, the fundamental thing we need to know in antimony is how we write a reaction. And the antimony was originally designed to write chemical reactions. And so its fundamental way of specifying things is in the form of a reaction here. I have a viral infection model. T goes to I1 at a rate beta times T times V. And I would write that almost exactly as it's written here. Reaction name, colon, T goes to I1, semicolon, and then the rate, beta times T times V, semicolon. So in a sense, for writing a chemical reaction, it couldn't be simpler you more or less type exactly what you see. It's important to note that this one chemical reaction always implements two ODEs. If I have T and I, one here, then I'll have an ODE for T and an ODE for I1. So there's a direct relationship between the arrows that you'd write in chemical reactions and what you type in antimony. X goes to Y at a rate B times X. Reaction one, X goes to Y semicolon B times X. Y goes to X at a rate C times Y. Reaction two, Y goes to X at a rate C times Y.
So when you see the chemical reaction, you can type it immediately in Adam. If I name the reaction J1 and J2, then the rate B times X is available as a variable in my dictionary. If I don't name it, then I don't have access to the rate. Again, each arrow diagram may affect multiple ODEs. In this case, I have X going to Y. That means X is being destroyed at a rate B times X. Y is being created at a rate B times X. Y goes to X, rate C times Y. X is being created at a rate C times Y. Y is being destroyed at a rate C times Y. So in this case, I have two chemical species. So I have two ordinary differential equations. I have two rate laws, x to y, y to x. If I'm dealing with chemical reactions, I often will have what's called stoichiometry. Two, mole two atoms of hydrogen react with one atom of oxygen to make water. Um, if I have a chemical reaction, three molecules of A plus five of B go to make A plus two B times C times plus nine times D, I can write those in atomony directly. Three A plus five B goes to A plus two C plus nine D. And atomony will automatically handle the bookkeeping for how many molecules of each kind get destroyed and created. That's very convenient to do if you're doing chemical reactions. Notice that you do not use a time symbol. You use the number and the variable name with no separator uh, when you're writing the antimony. Another thing is that antimony coming out of C uh, uses the caret uh, for exponentiation whereas Python uses the double star for exponentiation. If I want to raise something to the third power, it would be A caret three, not A star star three. That's a little bit of a confusion if you do the things that are complicated. Um, sometimes you don't care where a species comes from or where it goes, uh, in which case you're allowed to write arrows which don't have either a source or a sink on them. If I write nothing goes to A at a rate K, that's equivalent to writing DA by DT equals K. And that would be written E1 colon arrow A semicolon K. If I want A to decay, A goes to nothing at a rate K times A. I write that E2 colon A goes to nothing at a rate K times A. That gives me dA by dt equals minus k times a. I'm allowed to write ODEs directly. If I write t prime equals beta times t times v, that gives me the equation dt by dt equals beta times t times v. That's functionally equivalent to writing E1 colon nothing goes to t semicolon beta times t times v. So why don't we do a little mini exercise to check this out for you. Uh, here, I've written E1, nothing goes to T at a rate K0, T plus V, and so on. Why don't you try to write the ODEs for this? Take a minute and try to write out the ODEs. As a hint, you have to have one ODE for each species. So there'll be an ODE for T, V, I1 and D. Compared to learning Python or C++ or even CompuCell XML, the language of antimony is extremely simple. Basically, everything you need is in this. 
with one or two small exceptions, which we're not really going to cover in this class. So why don't people write the ODEs for this and then, okay, maybe Pedro, are you willing to get people started? Why don't you give us the equation for T and explain how you get it? Okay, so we have a creation of T. So I would write T prime equals K zero at first, constant production of T. And then T is being, uh, T is being um, um, consumed, converted into I1. So in this case, I would write minus K1 times T times V. And this term would appear in the I1 prime equation. Okay, great. Um, Alex, do you want to try the next one would be for V? What would the, what would the equation be for V? So I just had minus K1 TV. Since we don't see the creation of V, it's just being consumed. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Uh, William, what's the equation for I1? William, you there? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, isn't it just K2 times I1 for the D? Or... No. No. So... Where how many how many lines does I one appear in here? I one. I mean two two lines. Right. So there gotta be at least two terms. Uh if the arrow points to I one, is I one being created or destroyed? Uh you mean in the second equation? Yes. Uh created. Fine. So you have to start out by saying d i1 dt equals, now what would it be? What do you get from e2? Let's try not just giving him the answer, but let's just look here. We're looking here. Yeah. d one dt equals what, William? d1 versus d, it equals k1 times t times v. Right, and okay. Good. And what about here? Is that destroying or creating I1? Destroying. Fine. So we have a minus sign. Uh-huh. What do we have? K2 times I1. Okay, good. Perfect. Okay, Santoshi. What is the equation for D? Well, what goes on the left-hand side of any rate equation? Look at what we have here. Uh, D by DD by DT. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Fine. Is D being created or destroyed here? In uh, created. Fine. And how fast is it being created? Just read read this equation. Uh, it's like uh, K2 into I1. There we go. Okay. So it would be a good thing to practice that until everyone can do that quickly. Okay. Yeah. Yes. That's that's uh, that's the basics. Everybody got through that. That's great. It takes a little while to practice it, but uh, it's not. It's it's completely mechanical. Everything that you see here in this figure will correspond precisely to something that you have in your equations and vice versa. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, so here, here are the results and it's exactly what we went through. Okay. Um, any parameter that we use in a simulation has to be specified. So if we have beta here and V as parameters, we have to give them values. And it's good practice 
although we will not do it in class today because we're just doing abstract equations. We're not actually representing things that are really biological. You should always indicate the units uh, of uh, parameters. If the parameter is a rate, uh, it should be given as per day, per hour, per minute. Uh, if the units of viral, this is a viral load, uh, TCDID50 is a way of measuring viral concentrations, uh, you should give the units. Uh, the same for amounts. Here, T0 is a number of cells, for example, or the concentration of a chemical. So it's a good practice always to put as a comment uh, the units of the thing that you're describing. Again, for today, we're going to be talking about abstract A, B, and C, so they're not going to have units. Okay. You should also give the initial values for all of your variables, although if you do not specify the values, uh, they'll be set to zero. But as a matter of good practice, you should always set the initial values as well. If you fail to specify a parameter value, the simulation will crash. If you fail to specify an initial value of a variable, uh, it will be set to zero. Antimony also allows you to define uh, what are called functions and events. Uh, these are a little bit more sophisticated. We're not going to be using them today. Uh, you can look in the antimony reference manuals online for how to do it or in that one-page cheat sheet that we've got. Uh, there are a couple of antimony annoyances, uh, which I'll tell you about now. Uh, you cannot use certain reserved words um, as variable names or parameter names. Uh, that's not so surprising, but antimony will die with uninformative errors if you do. Uh, time maybe is an obvious thing not to use. You shouldn't call a variable time. Um, but gamma is a reserved word because the gamma function is a predefined mathematical function that antimony provides. And so if you're going to use common words as variable names, it's a good idea to add a number after them. So write gamma one or delta one rather than gamma or delta. Um, that, that'll help avoid uh, that kind of error. Uh, if you have missing or extra parentheses or missing or improper separators, uh, tellurium tends to die with uninformative errors as well. Um, if you find that your antimony generates errors, your best bet is to comment out everything. You can use the hash to comment things out and then make sure that it loads. And then uncomment out a few lines at the top, starting from the end of the model specification, working your way upward. Um, first uncomment the variable initializations, um, then the parameter initializations. Um, if they're events, you have to uncomment those one at a time, and then uncomment the rate loss one at a time. And that's the fastest way to debug. It's not very convenient, but that's what you're stuck with. For simple models, we shouldn't run into that, but uh, sometimes people will have antimony models with hundreds or even thousands of lines in them, and then debugging is pretty hard. Okay. Uh, so we've already done some screen sharing. Let us actually implement a very simple antimony infection model. We've already talked about it. So we're going to have T goes to I1 at a rate beta times T times V. And again, you've, we've covered all of this before. Um, what I want you to do now is instead of line 6, 7, 10, 11, 14, and 15, I want you to replace line six and seven with this line, E1 colon T goes to I1 semicolon beta times T times V semicolon. After parameters, 
replace B equals and C equals with beta equals 6.2 e to the minus 5, semicolon, you don't need the comment, V equals here 10,000, T0, 1, E7, T equals 10, T0. And use the save as, because you're actually going to have to roll back to this version of the code, and so you don't want to you don't want to lose it. The original version you don't want to lose. And run that and tell me what you get. Again, don't worry about typing all the comments. Just just the values. Notice that you're also going to have to change in line 18 where it says variables. We're not going to have an X and a Y anymore. So you're going to have to change X to T and Y to I1. The good news is that it's always going to be the same thing. You're going to type the rate equations. You're going to type the initial parameter values, the initial condition values, and then you'll change the variables to plot the things that you care about. That's all you have to do to use this code. So if you can do it for one line, you can do it for 20 lines. Just repeat the process. Uh, I don't know why, but I'm getting error in model. Same thing. Okay. Uh, do you want to screen share it? Yeah, yeah. It's like... I thought it's just like this, right? Yeah, let's see. So you don't have to, you don't need to type the comments, but you could, it's fine to do that. Mm -hmm. um, it's the spaces in the comment character. You can't have a space between the slashes and parameters and equations. You mean like this? In line eight? Line eight. Also, oh, so no spaces between those? No, that's a different character. So, no, no. In line eight, in line seven now. Oh, you mean this one? Yes. Okay. And in line five as well. Try saving that. Run. Uh, it says that. Valid continuation by. Let's look back. It the it ran before, right? The first. Oh, yeah, version. yeah. It's like before this one. It ran. Okay, fine. So the problem is that you have a typo. Let's see whether we can find the typo. Well, one thing we could do to begin with would be just delete the comments. Okay. Um. Sometimes, sometimes the issue is that we have a. Again, oh, I, I, I see it. Um, I see it. Um, in line, in line uh, six, you have a colon instead of a semicolon between I one and beta. Oh, this one. Yes, that's got to be semicolon. There you go. No semicolon. Oh, semicolon. Yes. There you go. Oh, yeah, it works. Should be like this, right? Yep, that's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank yeah, you. It's, it's a little hard to see on this when screen sharing, but um, the colon and the semicolon are different things. The semicolon oh. defines blocks and the colon defines a name. All right. So you should have gotten something that looked like that. Okay. Okay. So now uh, let's try one more different. Let's try changing it a little bit more. Um, let's try writing a chemical reaction. A plus B goes to C. I write K times A times B. So try changing it uh, again. Uh, you're only going to be changing those couple of lines. Uh, give that a shot and, and try, 
try it. Now, in this case, I say you should always indicate time units and concentration units. Again, in the example we just did, those were there. In this one, I'm leaving them out because it's just an abstract model. In reality, uh, the couple of examples we're going to do here, A, B, and C, are going to be very generic. Um, but uh, in reality, we would actually give these meaningful names, like the number of cancer cells or the concentration of virus or the amount of ATP or ADP. But for the purpose of saving you time typing here in class, we're going to see some models which don't have comments and have short names like A, B, and C. Okay. So why don't we try changing that again? Now trying this. Uh, see if you can get that one to work too. This was a little bit of a trick question. Did yeah, this, you got this one working? Yeah, I realized that was a trick question too. <laughs> Thought I, may, I thought I had something wrong, and I looked at it closer. Well, you have to have a little bit of chemistry in your mind to, to, to understand why it's a trick, huh? It looks, when you do this, it looks like it might be wrong, right? What What's the trick? Alex, do you want to screen share it and tell us what the trick is? So you start with no A, reaction. It's K times A times B. And if there's no A, there can never be any C. So all we're seeing is just the 10B to infinity, 0C and 0A as well. Thank you. That's perfect. Uh, if you have a chemical reaction, A plus B goes to C, and you don't have any A, there's no reaction. So nothing happens. There's no reaction because there's no A. So now try changing the initial value of A. Um, make a value of A equal to one, run it and see what happens. Make it three, see what happens. Five, see what happens. 10, see what happens. 15, see what happens. Now we could easily make those, write a little Python, uh, two lines of Python that would do that within the program. But for the moment, just do it by hand change the value of A, hit save, run it, change the value of B, hit save, run it, A, A again, run it. Screenshot the, the results and put put them on your, on your desktop somewhere uh, so that you can keep track of what you get. Okay, did people, were people able to change the value and see what, what happened when you did? Did that work? So here's what I get when I do it. Um, these plots are generated slightly differently, so I apologize that they're not going to be exactly the color scheme and things that you have on your screen. But if I start out with just a little bit of A, I use up, that's in blue, I use up my A, and then everything saturates. If I start out with five units of A, I use up half of my B, and things saturate. If I start out with 10 units of A, I use up all of the B, and I wind up with all C and no A and no B. If I start up with more A than B, I use up all my B and then I stop. So the initialization has drastic impact is what what you're saying, right? Yeah. The, set, the setup, yeah. initial conditions or whatever makes huge difference. Now, that's actually the opposite of the example that was loaded. If I have a reversible reaction, a, a go, X goes to Y, Y goes back to X, then the final concentrations of X and Y do not depend on the initial concentrations. And this is, this is not mathematics or, or, or computing. This is chemistry. So if I have an irreversible reaction, the final concentrations of my components depend sensitively on my initial concentrations. If I have a reversible chemical reaction, the final concentrations of my components are independent of the initial concentrations. If we had if we had a little more time and it were more we were we were doing more more network analysis, then we would we would go through the analysis of those problems, but. But here we just have to note that there 
that in one case, the initial concentrations really do determine the outcome, in the other case they don't. That's a good point. Okay. So let's do one more simple example before we take a break. Um, the simple example here will be extending what we had. Uh, now we'll have A goes to B, B goes to C, C goes to D. Um, and you better, it doesn't say it, but you better start out with a non-zero amount of A to make this not meaningful. Um, and so now you'll have to go from having one line to having three lines here. You'll have three parameters, K, A, K, B, K, C. And you'll have to add a line in the variables to plot D as well as C. Okay. So let's see if we could do that. I'll walk you through it a little bit. Um, write each chemical reaction as an added money reaction specification. So you'll have three lines there. To find the initial values for A, B, C, and D, which you'll do here. To find the rate constants K, A, B, K, B, K, C. And then you'll have to change the variables here by adding D. Okay. So why doesn't everybody try to get that one work? And I should have said again, make sure that your initial amount of A is 10. Anything except zero. If you've got it done, you could try changing the initial values of A, B, and C or change the rate constants, K, A, K, B, K, C. Um, you can actually get some rather interesting things when you play with the rate constants. Okay, William, how's it going? I'm kind of a little confused about like the C to D part. Is it the same, just adding one value? Okay, do you want a screen share and maybe we can work on it together? Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. So I changed the values to, to, to C, but I thought in, do we, do I just add like D equals, equals a certain value and just. You need to add all the equations first. So you need to oh. write each chemical reaction. You have three chemical reactions. So you have to write three chemical reactions. Right, there we go. And the chemical reaction. Okay, um, William, did you get a screenshot the equations now? Yeah, I did. You want to do you want a screen share again and show okay, us? Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, over here. So this is it like B plus C equals. Well, what is the equation? You type oh. exactly what you have there. Oh, okay. Does anybody want to try to help William out here? Is it like this? That's good on the on the arrows, but what about the rates? Uh, is it K times A times A? Oh, it's this right? No, no. Uh, but I thought it's like. Um, the parameter is named K A. Yeah. Times A. So K A yeah. times A. There you go. Oh, okay, got it. And so now you have to define the initial values of K A, K B, and K C in lines 10 and afterwards. So, no, in line 10. Line 10. Oh, okay. Okay. 
There you go. You can make them all equal to one. It's fine. Okay. Perfect. Good. Great. That should do it. Give it a try. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. How about uh, Santoshi? Let's look at your code for a second. I may be right, but let's just take a look at your. Can we? Can you screen share your Twitter? Let's take a look together. Um. So you're doing the same thing that William did. Why? It, the rate should be k a times a, not k a times a squared. There we go. That looks fine now. So okay, great. That looks good. Yeah. I hope that that makes sense for people. It's not, you know, it's not that bad. You've been able to take a chemical reaction, type it, and get it to run. And of course, it'll take some practice to get everything to work. But but uh, it's not any nothing you're going to do with this is that much more complicated than what you've done on the, on the network side. Coupling the networks to CompuCell takes a little bit more work, but the basic network part of it we've got pretty good. All right. Well, I think that this is probably a good place to take a break. Um, if you get back early from the break, you can try changing the initial amounts of A, B, and C or changing the rate constants. Um, and uh, here are some exercises you could do. Um, it's rather interesting. If you make the rate constants 1, 10, and 100, or 1, 0.1, and 0.01, you get rather interesting results. Did anybody try out this exercise uh, making Ka, Kb, Kc 1, 10, and 100? Have that one right now, and then try 1.01 and point one point one and point oh one. In this case, it's it's convenient to change the time, the duration of the simulation, which we can't really do yet. Change change the time scale. I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Did, what did you get when you did that? Did it change things? You certainly don't get a curve that looks like that, do you, anymore? Do you want to show us what you got? It's the one and a hundred. Okay, so then you probably have to start it again. And, and just, if you keep it running, it's sort of, okay, you have to hit pause. Okay, all right. That's one ten a hundred? I think so. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. And let's try. Let's try uh, the other one. One point one and point oh one. So. What happens, what happens, it's a little hard to see it the way we've got it here. The 110, 100, everything happens more or less at the same time, but the maximum values go down as you go through the cycle sequence. When you do 1.1.01, the maximum values of each one are about the same, but the time for the maximum goes up by a factor of 10 each time. So the blue one peaks... The green one peaks 10 times later than that, and the yellow one will peak 10 times later than the green one. And so in the first case, you could have all the reactions occur at the same time where the maximal values are different. In the second one, you get the maximum values all being the same, but the time at which they occur are different. And so it's rather interesting. You could get both of those very different results from the same three reactions by changing the reaction rates. That's something that that again is is deserves to be explored in more detail than we have time for in this in this in this exercise. 
but it gives you a place to start thinking about these kinds of problems. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so now we're going to go one more little exercise with chemical reactions. Um, you know how to make A go to B, B go to C, C go to D. Add one more line where D goes back to A. And see how things are different. This comes back to the question Kyle asked. Kyle had to run away. But he, he noticed that the first equ equations we wrote, the final concentrations were independent of the initial conditions. In the second equation we wrote, the final the final concentrations depended on the initial conditions. In the one we just did, everything winds up being D with nothing else. So the final concentrations are all D that doesn't depend on initial conditions. Uh, in this one, see what happens. So again, you keep exactly what you have, but you'll add one, one additional reaction, D goes to A, at a rate KD times D. William, were you able to get that to work? Why don't we screen share it? We can look through it together. Okay, yeah, sure. Uh, where is this? Okay, so... Yeah, that looks right. Yeah. I want to start it again because it's not oh. very interesting after... Yeah. You shouldn't have to... You just hit stop and start again. It shouldn't have to over restart player. Yeah, this is the problem I had with like hate hate and I just face because like I don't know why. If I hit this one, it just hit crashes. Pause. Hit pause. You mean this one? Yeah. That's fine. Okay, good. Let's take a look at this. Let's see. Okay. This is correct. This is right. Mm -hmm. You'll notice that for the old one, you wind up with all D. Okay. Well, one thing is you don't have D plotted, do you? So you have to go into your code and you in the variables you have to add D. Oh, okay, got it. I'll do that. Yeah, you're doing something which is very sensible, William, which is templating off of what you already have. Mm -hmm. That 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 saves a lot of time instead of trying to. to, to okay, good. Now hit pause. Okay, so every notice everything goes to the same concentration. You get the same amount of A, B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's go back to your code for a second. There's a cheap way to sort of trick this. Make KD equal to zero. That's equivalent to getting rid of line nine entirely. So we'll do it that way. Hit okay. save. And now run it again. Now here you'll notice everything goes to D. There's no A, no B, no C, mm -hmm. and all D. So it's a very different result. In one case, you wind up with only D. In the other case, you wind up with equal amounts of A, B, C, and D. Okay. Uh, so that's called chemical equilibrium when you have when you have the balance of all four components. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that the amounts are equal, uh, but it does mean that you have you have uh, steady state for all of them. Okay. Great. Okay. Now, we could play a little bit more, and it's something maybe you could do on your own. If you change the values of Ka, K, let's just do one one of those. Put put Kd back to 1. Put Kd back to 1. And now let's make Kb 10 instead of 1. Remember that before, when we ran it, we had equal amounts of A, B, C, and D. Now let's run it and see what happens. You'll notice now, which is blue, B. You have yeah, 10 B. points less blue. Everybody else is equal. Mm -hmm. And so when you change those rates, K, A, K, B, K, C, K, D, you could change the amounts of the, that you get of each species at the end. So here was the sample result when all of the rate constants were equal. And... Uh, we, we showed an example where we changed. Okay, so I'd like to talk uh, now about how to actually connect 
CompuCell and and uh, and uh, the network models. And uh, you've seen this picture before. It's a simulation of seminogenesis that was done back in 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, by Susan Hester and Julio Belmonte, who were graduate students at the time. Uh, in this case, we have a rather complicated set of chemical reactions uh, that are operating inside each cell independently. And those chemical reactions are uh, interacting between cells and also with this external chemical field. And you get uh, these chemical reactions are oscillating chemical reactions. And so let me play it again. You see these color oscillations here on the right. Those are actually concentrations of one species. Um, let's see which one it is here. Um, it's this one here, DLC. It's the one you're seeing. Yeah. You'll see that the colors will oscillate in those other reactions. So if we want to build a complicated model like that, we have to understand, one, how do we put uh, a network inside a single cell? Then how do we change the values of the network from CompuCell? And how do we use the values of the network to control the cell parameters? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And we'll do a very simple exercise, uh, uh, which is not that illuminating. It's really just to teach us how to do the coding. And then next week, we will do something a little bit more uh, biologically meaningful. Um, that was one example of a simulation. This is a classic example where there is a simulation of the regulation of cell growth and division. This is actually rather an old simulation, and you'll notice the colors don't quite line up with the outline of the cell, because that was a very old version of Compute Cells. So it was a simulation we wrote 10, 10 or 12 years ago. Um, but what we have here are molecules called cyclins. Uh, the oscillations of the cyclins determine what the phase of the cell cycle is. Uh, and here, the phase of the cell cycle is then causing cell growth and division. This is the simulation we're going to write next week. Maybe we'll start on it this week. I don't know how far we'll get. Um, in which the cells have internal uh, uh, chemical signaling called delta notch. And there's also contact signaling between neighboring cells that leads to this uh, salt and pepper patterning that you see. This is a very important biological process uh, in development and uh, also in cancer. Okay, so when we're going to combine uh, network models with CompuCell, um, there are a number of things that we have to be able to do. We first have to be able to specify the network model. Um, that could be the way we just did it in a string. Uh, it could be read from a file. Uh, it could be specified in antimony, which is this very simple language that we've used, which I like because it's human readable. Uh, it could be specified in SBML, System Biology Markup Language, which is a standard language but is not so human readable. It's an XML. Uh, or CellML, which is another markup language standard. Or uh, MABUS, this uh, Boolean network model specifier. Then we have to load the network model either into the whole simulation, which is what we were just doing, although we didn't talk about how to do that, or into individual cells. We have to be able to time step that model uh, in sync with the movement of the cells. Now we have to be able to connect the network model to the cell level. So we have to be able to read and write antimony variables and parameters from the uh, compu cell level. Uh, we have to learn how to couple variables between cells if we want to do that. And then uh, we probably won't need it, but it's possible to unload models as well as load them. Uh, for example, if you want to do cell differentiation, uh, the cell might have a different network after differentiation. So it's possible to take models out as well as put them in. Uh, that's mainly because it takes time to run the models, and so things run faster if you don't need them by taking them out. So again, uh, we're going to define our antimony model. 
I don't know what happened to the L and model. Um, uh, and we'll do it the way we just did it, so we, we know how to do that. Um, we can, in fact, load multiple antimony models into a single cell if we want to. Um, uh, or some cells may have one model and some cells might have another. Um, we do have to keep track by hand of the conversion between antimony time units and MCS. Um, that time step we have to define. Um, we can, in principle, load a model into all cells. We can load it into cells by specified by cell ID. Um, we can specify to load the model into all cells of a given type, load it into all blue cells, all green cells, or we could have uh, a model that runs in the background. Depending on what we're trying to do, uh, so these things can be more or less convenient. Um, uh, if we're going to overwrite a model uh, systematically, uh, sometimes it's more convenient to use one form than another. Uh, we'll come back to the syntax. You don't have to remember it. Uh, it's in Twitit. Um, to load antimony models from a string, typically uh, we'll do that in the start function. Um, self dot add antimony model to cell will load a model into a cell. Um, and if we do that, we specify the cell. We give the model string name. That's the model was this, we give the model string. The model name has to be assigned, so you have to give it a name. Uh, the cell you're loading it into and the step size, the conversion of Monte Carlo steps to antimony time steps. We can add it to cell IDs, in which case we list all the cell IDs we're going to add it to, cell number 16, cell number 22, cell number 54. Uh, we could add it to all cells of a given type, underscore types, then the list of the cell types that we're going to add it to. Uh, add free-floating antimony model gives us a model that runs in the background globally. Model name is going to specify how we refer to this model from Python. Step size specifies how many antimony time units we run per Monte Carlo step. And in, we can also read from a file if we want uh, and then instead of model string equals model, we'd say model file equals, and then the path name to the file. It's also possible to overwrite the initial conditions that we specified in the antimony model. There's initial conditions equals, and then this is going to be a dictionary. Um, you could say initial conditions S1 is something S2 and so on. That would go in the same string. We're probably not going to use that today, uh, but I'm showing it to you so that if you run into it in a simulation, you won't get surprised by it. Okay. So, um, if we want to load a free floating antimony model, uh, we would put our code in the start function, a line in the start function. Uh, we can go to CC3D Python, SBML Solver, add free-floating antimony model. So Twitter has that built in. Um, it will paste in a code, uh, add free-floating antimony model, and the code that's pasted in is not will not run. You have to edit it. So this is a case where the, the default code that uh, Twitter gives you has to be edited. And it will give you uh, a choice. It'll say model file equals model file, model string equals model string. You can't have both. If you're using the string that you specified, for example, up here in lines 66 through 71, then you delete model file equals model file and just keep model string. If you're going to read the model from a file, then you'd keep the model file and get rid of the model string. Okay.
I'm here, I've made it a little bit more readable. Add free floating out of money model, model string equals, here I named the model string ODE model string. I'm gonna give it the name, model name equals ODE model. So I'm gonna reference it inside of CompuCell. And then I've said the step size is going to be equal to some parameter that I'm gonna spe specify, SBML step size. To time step and a money models, and this will go in the step function, I have a simple function, self dot time step underscore SBML open close parenthesis. I note that that will time step every model at once. So you only call that once per Monte Carlo step. If you put that inside of a loop and call it 50 times, you'll time step all of your models 50 times. So you always put that outside of the loop at the beginning of the of the uh, of the step function. There are some options for the time stepping. Uh, relative and absolute control the accuracy of the simulation. There are numerical errors whenever you do these simulations, and you have to say what error you're willing to tolerate. Uh, normally, you won't play with these. Um, occasionally, you'll get something that looks very strange. You'll get something called a CVODE error, CVODE error. Um, and when you do that, it means that uh, the, the time step that you used was too big, and you have to change it. We shouldn't run into that uh, in this class, uh, but it's something you need to know about. Um, and you have self.setSBML global options, which you can use to specify these things. You can also specify whether you're using the normal ODE solvers or Gillespie solvers, um, the stochastic solvers. Okay. To time step the antimony model, you put your, your cursor in the step function, pull down the Python uh, Python menus, pull down SBML solver, and you say time step SBML models. And that will paste in the code that you need. Self.timestep SBML. All antimony models variables and parameters show up as dictionary entries inside of CompuCell. So if I called my model ODE model, cell.sbml.ode model would reference that model, square bracket, quote, the name of the variable or the parameter will give me access and I can read or write to that. So if I say variable equals self.sbml.model name, variable name, I've read it into Python. And similarly, I can set it. I don't have to use a get set function, simply a dictionary entry. If I want the whole set of all of the variables and parameters in the model, I can obtain that using the function values. So if I say result equals self.sbml.ode model dot values, open close parenthesis, that will give me a list of all of the uh, current states of that model. So if I don't remember how to do that, say in my step function, Go to SBML solver, get SBML value for free floating model. And that will give me self.sbml.model name, value name. I have to update model name and value name. Model name would come here from line 94. Value name has to come from up here, 82, 81, 80, and so on. Um, if you are using a cell division, 
the uh, normal cell, co the attribute copy, when you do cell division, will automatically copy whatever network models you loaded. You don't have to worry about that. It's handled for you. Uh, if for some reason you want to copy the model from a cell to another cell by hand, you can do that. I don't think I've ever used that function, but it's there. Um, if you want to remove a model from a cell, you can delete it. That one you use not so often, but you do use it in complicated models. Okay. okay. So now uh, you have a little assignment. This is a little bit of a longer assignment, perhaps. Well, it's not very complicated. Uh, you can keep the code that you already had, uh, or you can use the Python snippets. Um, generate a simple simulation with two kinds of cells. You can call it proliferating or quiescent or just dark or light or A and B. Uh, give them a contact energy and a volume constraint. Set the target volume of each cell to 125. Define a basic antimony model where A goes to B at a rate K1 times A, B goes to A at a rate K2 times B. Or you could even keep the antimony model you have now. Really, it doesn't matter. Um, what, I, what I want you to do is load the antimony model as a free-floating model and make sure CC3D can time step it. Retrieve the data from the free-floating model and plot the state variables. At time 1,000, increase the value of variable A by a factor of 10. And so I'll give people 10 minutes to try to do that. If you have any questions, ask. But everything that you need to do is either in the demo code that we've been working with or in uh, the Python snippets that we've just shown how to access, okay? So if you have a question about that, please ask. But uh, this is a little bit more challenging. Still a very simple model, but I'm asking you to use the things that we did in the first half of the class now a little bit more independently. So give it a try. What we want is something that looks like that. So the second step, we know how to do that. That uses the, the things that we've done before. I hope everybody got that. Um, the second one was defining the antimony model. And in that case, we needed to type the rate equations, A goes to B, B goes to A, give it some additional parameters and initial conditions. The next thing that we have to do is in the start function, we have to add that model. And the step function, we have to add the time step. And the last thing we have to be able to do is plot it. So we have to create a plot window with A and B. And then in the step function, we have to be able to read the value of A and B and add those values to the plot. And you should get something that looks like that. Do you want me to walk you through that again? I can go back step by step and have you have you look at the at the code if you want to copy it. Would that be helpful? Where is everybody able to generate the basic simulation? That's all in XML. You don't use any Python. Any questions about how to do that? That one? Okay, so now somewhere at the beginning of your code, it could be almost anywhere in the simulation, uh, you want to type your antimony model. Okay, so let me come here. So so in the start function, self.add floating antimony model, the name of the model, the, the string that you defined, the model name, well, my model if you like, step size, 
and then in the step function self dot time step SPL. And again, you don't have to type all this from scratch. You could use the twitit, uh, the twitit snippets, and then edit it. Probably a little fast. So let me know when you're ready to to move on from this. Okay. And you might try running it just after this uh, without putting in the plots. Make sure that it doesn't crash so you can debug if you've got a typo in your code somewhere, you can find it. And then we can put the plots in after that. So if we're going to do the plot, we have to do in the start function, we have to paste our add plot. And we're going to have to change the title here. I called it free floating model variables. And, and uh, I change the style of A and B to dots. And then in the step function, I have to add a equals self dot SBML my model a, b equals self dot SBML my model b, and then I add a and b to the plot. And again, I strongly encourage you to use the the twitit uh, functions for doing. That. Not going to be very interesting, but it should run. Now, if you've already got that working, uh, the next exercise would be to load it into the individual cells. Uh, and to do that, you actually only have to change two lines of code. But, so Alex, if you feel like doing that while the, the others are catching up with this, that's fine. Alex, let's, let's, let's walk through your version for the moment, if it's working. All right, fine. So, so let's look at the XML first. So you created two cell types, proliferating and quiescent. You gave them default contact energies. You gave them a target volume of 125, great. And you used uniform initializer to create the initial configuration. Okay, okay. that looks fine. And now let's look at the Tellurium steppable. So at the top, you created a model with the rates here and lines four through 17, right? And now you have start function, you add the free floating antimony model, right? Step size of one, you create the plot window, right? Um, Then you're actually doing something. You're actually using the code we had, which is a little fancier, to do the to create the plot. Uh, I assume people would do the plot by hand. You're using the code, but you're you're you're, you're modifying the code we already had, which is a little fancier. Okay, and then we're reading the values and putting them in the plot. Yep, that looks fine. And then at time a thousand, we're changing the value of a. Okay, so let's run that and see what we get. That looks fine. The one thing I might do is I might move my blob of cells to the middle so it doesn't run. Yeah, I have to fix that. And yes, you see a change at, at that time. So that looks fine. So, so since we're going to run out of time, for people who, who didn't get this, this will be I'll I'll create this as a homework assignment for you. Uh, but you can you can work on it on your own before the homework officially comes out. But Alex, why don't you see about changing the fixing the fixing that for the moment? Okay. All right. So. You should get something that looks like this. Alex got. Oh. 
And then at time uh, here, I said 400, I have the value change. So the last thing that I was hoping to do today, and in a sense, it's not uh, any more difficult. And maybe we could do it together on Alex's code. Would be we loaded a free floating model, but instead of loading a free floating model, I'd like to load that model into all cells individually. Um, and then plotting the values isn't going to make sense. We'd have to add attributes A and B to the cell dictionary and display them as auxiliary fields. So why don't we why don't people screenshot this little assignment? And then Alex, let's work on that together on your screen. And that'll be the last thing we'll do. Okay. So does everybody have a screenshot of this uh, so, this little exercise? Okay, so Alex, let's let's look at your code, and we'll we'll see quickly how to do. It. Should be a little more centered. Yeah, that is, that's fine. Exactly where it is doesn't matter. It's just so it's, it's, yeah. it's an aesthetic problem rather than a, a functional problem. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is instead of saying self add free floating antimony model, we can remove that. We're going to have to add, we're going to have to add it and we're going to want to in the next line, we're going to go to CC3D Python, SBML, and said add antimony model to cell types. Okay. And now we have to look at our other code and we're not going to be reading from a file. So we get rid of model file equals model file. And we have to make the model string name, whatever it was. Fine. And now we need to give the cell type names there. I think that's right. I think I'm missing an I. No, oh, there's the typo in your in your cell type name. Okay, and then we need quiescent also when you're loaded to both. Yeah, it's unfortunate that you have to capitalize that. It'd be a lot easier if you didn't. And then step size, uh, did you already define step size? You just make it one, probably, yeah. And then we don't need initial conditions or integrator. We can get rid of that. Okay, good. And let's see if that runs. Ah, because we, we we asked for, okay, sorry, that's my mistake. So now let's go back to the Python. Um, when we tried to read it, the plot, we, we can, we don't, we don't, the plot windows don't make any sense anymore. So 39, 46, 47, none of that makes any sense. And then also there doesn't make sense. And so now let's look at what we want to do now is copy those values, not to A and B, but to a dictionary entry. So we want to say cell, cell. So we want to loop over the cells now. We want to create a loop over all cells. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. And now Cop, move line 60 and 61 down after that. And instead of self.sbml model, it will be cell.sbml model. 
And now we want to create a dictionary entry. So it'll be cell.dict quote A equals on the left. There we go. Same thing for B. I realize it looks funny to have to copy from a dictionary entry of the cell to a dictionary entry of the cell. That's only for plotting that we need to do that. Okay. And now the other thing that we have to do, okay, so in line 74, that we'll have to do the same thing, which is, let's let's just comment out line 74, seven, those lines for the long. Get things right. And now we need to create a, a tracking field for A for A and B. And that has to go up at the top. Tra and tracking fields go in, actually in the init. So all the way at the top. There. Well, after that step over the base. So extra fields automatic tracking. Scalar attribute. First one. And then we can call it A and B. Just A, field name A, attribute name A, and then copy it and have B. Okay. Let's save that and run and see if that runs. So this is not fallable. Line 67. Okay, so let's look at line 67. Oh, because you, you have a parenthesis. Oh. <laughs> okay, and now let's see about A and B fields. Cell field. Pull, if you put, so they're A and B. So they're pretty trivial, but they're there. So the last thing we could do, and this was the exercise, the last exercise that I wanted to do, was this is totally boring. But we can make it a little bit less boring by changing the value of when we load the, when we load the uh, simulation into the cells, we can randomize the uh, the rate constants. So why don't we do that as our last little thing, little exercise. So when we load the cells at the beginning, um, here we do antimony model. So after line 41, for example, let's change the rate, one of the rate constants. So let's let's see how we're going to do that. Um, let's we need to look at the name. We need to look at the model definition. Find a rate constant k one. So let's make the k. We're going to change k one. So now we're going to say k one. Okay. Now we're going to loop over all cells. So let's help that cell list. Okay. Cell list. Okay, and now we're going to say cell.spml.model square bracket quote k1 times equals and then you want to pull a random number between 0.5 and 2. See so if you can remember how to do that with, you'll have to use NumPy random. You may have to look that one up. That'll work. See if that'll run. And this time you should you should get different different results for each cell if it doesn't crash. Uh,
SMBL. Okay. SBML. It really should just be network. Huh? We should change SBML to network. Please. There we go. Now let's look at our, 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 our fields. So now they're different. And uh, I appreciate people staying up a few minutes late here. Uh, and I will see you next week.